Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to our Wednesday night prayer and Bible study time on uh, the 8th of July, 2020. Uh, here in a few minutes, we're going to be turning and finishing the book of Mark chapter 14. And we'll be starting about verse 42, 43. And so if you want to join us there, you can turn in your Bibles there uh, right now um, and hang on to it. We're going to talk about answers to prayer and prayer requests. We have a lot of prayer requests, some that have come in just recently. Uh, I put them on the text message prayer list, um, but we'll bring them to your attention tonight. And uh, just remember that if you have any prayer requests or answers to prayer, now you might say, well, what exactly is an answer to prayer? Well, I've driven to my mom's house and back last week safely. And I forget about all the traffic that we usually face in Carlsbad, and there's been no traffic. I drive up there and I drive back. I don't get stopped in traffic at all. So that's an answer to prayer, you know? And we ask God to take care of us and watch over us, and that's an answer to prayer. It keeps us safely in spite of things that we do that show our ignorance and or, uh, dare I say, stupidity. <laughs> Sometimes we do things and we're, we act pretty stupidly, but God protects us anyway. And so I'm thankful for that. I'm, I'm thankful for all that he's blessed us with. So today, um, we want to talk about some answers to prayer first. Uh, one of the first answers to prayer, um, many years ago, I was doing a Bible study at Congregational Towers here in Chula Vista. And um, Wanda Tribble was part of it, and Dorothy would go. We had some other ladies that would meet, and we started with some neat little videos, and uh, we went through some interesting times there. Um, and just before I had cancer surgery, um, it seems like I remember that uh, they were in the midst of remodeling, and we had to stop meeting for a while. But after I had my surgery at the end of December of 2014, um, I knew that I probably would not be able to make it to the Bible studies because of doing chemotherapy and stuff. And so Debbie took over for me, Debbie Johnson. And so for now from um, the beginning part of, of 2015 until the beginning part of 2020, uh, she was doing the Bible study. So for five years, uh, I've gone over there a couple of times and done stuff for her or met with them uh, so they would remember who I was. Um, but uh, I've been thankful that Debbie did that. Well, because of Debbie leaving and going to Texas uh, with her husband, um, and then um, because of the COVID virus, uh, we sort of shut the Bible study down. I had intended to take it over, but we sort of backed off. And then I got a phone call um, from, um, from, or Debbie text messaged me and said they want to, see if we'll start the studies again. So I conversed with the manager there at Congregational Towers, and uh, he was very gracious and said, absolutely, start it up again. Monday's at 2 o'clock, and I said, Monday's at 2 o'clock to 3 or 3.30. And so he told me what rooms we could meet in to be socially distanced. Um, and uh, at first, Fluffy said she'd call around, and she said, I think I have about seven people. So uh, when I went on Monday, I did my Bible study here at the church at 9 o'clock, and then I did it at Potter Machinery at uh, noon. And then at 2 o'clock, I went to Congregational Towers. And uh, I went up and got Wanda and brought her down. And then Teresa came and Fluffy came and Kay and Alba. I don't know Kay and Alba, but uh, they seem like really nice ladies. And so uh, we had a good time. We started looking at following the steps of the Messiah. So it was a very blessed Bible study, and I was glad those ladies were there, and they seemed to enjoy it. We sang with our mask on, and, you know, we weren't in church, so it's okay to sing. So we sang a little bit, watched a couple of videos, um, and then we watched about that and talked about the birth of Jesus. So I was glad to have that going again, that Bible study. Uh, Damien has started his new job, and he seems to be very happy with it. Uh, he's just praying for a few more hours. And uh, then Sandy's grandson, we were praying for him because his, one of his roommates uh, tested positive for COVID-19. And Eric has, been, has tested and been proven negative for COVID-19. So that's a big answer to prayer uh, for Sandy. I'm thankful that uh, we can continue to meet here at church. We actually had a visitor on Sunday, and I was glad for that. A lady who visited here before. Uh, 
and I uh, am thankful that we have had that ministry for Michi and Damien and uh, Katie who helped run that. And I'm also thankful for the guys and uh, Lord willing, if it doesn't rain tomorrow, they're going to help me again for Phil uh, and for Jerry and for Raymond and for Damien who have come and helped me take care of the yard and for Nona and for Mike who have also come and done some things. And so I, I appreciate those volunteers who've stepped up to help keep things looking nice. Um, we had a real blessing also on Sunday morning. My wife said it's going to be hot, so they turned the air conditioner on at the house. And um, the air conditioner is elderly, and sometimes elderly things stop working, as we well know. Uh, every year for the past two or three years, there's been kind of some kind of an issue. And uh, this one, I tried all the tricks that I knew to get it started, and... We sort of prayed about it because I said, well, I don't want to have to replace it, but if I have to replace it, I will. Um, so we called um, uh, Romero. Romero is part of the Spanish church, and he's an electrician as well as an HVAC guy. And Romero came over yesterday, and he looked at everything, and he said, it's perfectly fine. Uh, here's what I had to do, and if, I have to, if you have to come back, I can reorder that part to get that part fixed. But he said, otherwise, the system's good. It should last you for a good long time yet. So that's an answer to prayer. It saved me a little bit of money and a little bit of headache. And uh, now that my family can be happy if I let them turn the air conditioning on. Typically, it, 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 it's going to have to be pretty hot for us to turn the air conditioning on <laughs> in my house. Because I, I don't like to see that meter spinning. But that was a blessing uh, to have that taken care of. And... Um, we are also grateful the Lord opened the door finally. We have a little cat at our house, a female cat, and um, we wanted to make sure she would get taken care of so she wouldn't be able to have any baby kitties because uh, we don't need more. We have three dogs and two cats. and So finally, uh, we got the news that the animal uh, facility here would take her in today and do her surgery finally. She was scheduled all the way back in March to have her surgery, so she's just now had it. And so uh, we're glad God, that's taken care of. So um, I know somebody said, oh, we'd love to have baby kitties. The problem is I've found <laughs> that anytime you have baby kitties or puppies, everybody says, oh, they're so cute, but then they don't want them bad enough to take them home. <laughs> so now what do you do? I don't need more, okay? I don't need more. Uh, I'm looking here on the comments, and it's uh, Dave and Liz's 14 years of wedded bliss, their anniversary. Is that today? I'm, I'm thinking so. So uh, uh, we praise the Lord with them for 14 happy years of wedded bliss. Jerry says happy anniversary to you as well. Um, God protected uh, Justine the other night when she was out walking the dog, uh, but we do want to pray for her, uh, that God will be with her. Um, with that, uh, we want to bring these requests to you as well tonight. Um, Sam has uh, been taken to the emergency room. That's Melody's brother. Um, Sam has had some uh, physical issues. He's doing better, um, but I guess he was coughing up blood. So we want to pray for Sam. Uh, I will hear some more, I'm sure, from Melody a little later. Um, we want to pray for uh, Donna Fletcher's uh, family and friends. Donna has said to us um, that her sister, uh, Laureen, is having problems with neuropathy uh, issues, and so she would like us to pray for her uh, so she can have some relief. And also some friends, Dorothy and Chuck, who are going through some things, uh, a season of life that makes it a little difficult um, because of some things that are happening. So if you'll pray for Dorothy and Chuck. Um, pray for Lelia. Uh, Maratsik, she is our chaplain to uh, the prison systems, and we want to pray for her. Uh, their, her sister passed away recently, and so we want to pray. I uh, know that she's in heaven, but they want to pray for that. Also, um, one of the pastors that was here for 20 some odd years, he was called to be the pastor here in 1983, and he retired in 2003. His name is Oren Teal. Uh, he's been back a couple of times. Um, he's in the hospital. We weren't sure exactly what was wrong, but we need to pray for Oren Teal. Some of you remember him, perhaps. Um, I know Shirley probably would, and um, Sandy, and uh, Dorothy. 
and maybe David as well. So pray for Michael, pray for the White Mountain Apache Reservation, uh, that the Lord will help them and be with them. And um, continue to pray. Uh, we're glad that Shirley's back home safely, but keep her in prayer uh, for her family members and things as well. Uh, be in prayer for those who have COVID-19. Be in prayer for those that need work, for Tina and Tricia and Liz, that God can open some doors for them. Um, also pray for the lost. Continue to pray for those that need Jesus Christ. Um, I was struck as we've been preaching through this series, as I've been preaching on this series of loving your neighbor, and, and recently I've done a couple of Bible studies on prayer, and I, I was thinking and I really felt like the Lord led me to the message on Sunday, so you will see the bulletins coming, uh, with the outline in it about loving our neighbor enough to pray for them. And I'm going to talk about that Sunday morning. But um, instead of uh, having angst or hatred or anger or a dissatisfaction with someone, um, we need to pray for them. We need to pray for the lost. People are doing the things they're doing that are such terrible, wicked things because they don't know Jesus. And that would be a change in their heart and their life. So we want to pray for people that don't know Jesus. So let's bow our heads in a word of prayer tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for these things. Uh, we're thankful that Eric has been tested negative. Uh, we're thankful that Damien has a new job. Uh, we're thankful for the new Bible study that we have going uh, at the Towers and the interest there. We're thankful for uh, those that have been involved in volunteering, uh, whether it be um, Michi and Damien and Katie on Sundays or others have been checking temperatures, Dave and Liz, or uh, those have been coming to help with the yard work. Lord, I appreciate Phil and Jerry and Raymond and Damien and Nona and Mike and uh, all of them coming to help, and I appreciate and love them for that. We're glad that we're still able to assemble here. Thank you for the blessings at my household board with the air conditioning unit and also with uh, having the cat taken care of. And uh, we're thankful that you protected Justine. I uh, ask that you would continue to be with her uh, as she heals. Lord, uh, we pray for Sam tonight. We don't know yet what's happening with him. Uh, just have your hand on him and be with him. Lord, uh, he would say that he is ready at any time to go to be with you, but uh, be with his family as well. Uh, this is uh, unexpected development. We pray for Donna's friends, Dorothy and Chuck, in a new season in their lives that you might be with them. And for Donna's sister, Laureen, that you might be with her, Lord, tonight with her neuropathy. We pray for Lelia and her sisters, Lord, as one of the sisters has passed. You might be with that family. And I love you and have served you for years. Just give them peace and comfort, Lord, as is said in the scriptures. Also be with Orrin, Lord, as he is in the hospital, that they might find out what's going on with him and be able to take care of it. Uh, we pray for Larry Campbell, Lord, who has had a stroke and his cancer has gotten worse with the possibility of a tumor, that you might have your hand upon him and be with him. And we continue to pray for Mike that you might be with his health. Be with the unspoken request for Andrew as he uh, has COVID-19, uh, but you might be with him in a situation for Tina, for Dan, for Marilyn. Uh, we also pray for work for Tina and for Tricia and for Liz. And we pray for the lost. We pray for those that need Jesus Christ, Lord. Uh, we think of Peggy and Blanca and Kathy and Harry and Philip and Samantha. We think of uh, those who need to be living for you. Uh, the Hotzel family has asked us for prayer. The Biddlecom family, Lord, we don't want to forget as we pray for the Biddlecoms that you might be with Bob um, and help him with his cancer treatment, Lord. And we pray also for the Bradshaw family uh, as they're going through some things that you might give them some strength and watch over them every day. Lord, we're thankful uh, for your working, for the fact the Holy Spirit is still working, that you haven't left off doing your work to draw people to you for salvation. Help us to do our part to show people Jesus Christ, Lord, that we might truly love our neighbors. Um, help us to pray for the lost. And we might say, well, I just, I don't know that young man or that young woman who's doing such terrible things or has been accused of such terrible things, and uh, we need to just pray for them because they need Jesus Christ. Lord, help our hearts to be open to prayer to those. We ask that you might bless us as we study the book of Mark tonight. 
to finish this chapter, to reading, uh, reading up to the time of your crucifixion. Lord, that we might have our eyes opened and our ears listening to learn of great things. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Dave and Liz say thank you for the happy anniversary. All right. So Mark chapter 14. And we're going to begin reading there. Uh, the last place we left Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so we'll go back to um, page uh, number 40. Page, Mark chapter 14, verse number 41. Well, remember now, you, you, uh, we skipped over the crucifixion and all that. Yeah, we'll come back. We'll come back. We're going to do you, that next you week. You said you felt that. It just felt like you were putting the nails in his hands and all that stuff. Right. And so right. I didn't I didn't really know about well, it. Well we're gonna finish fourteen and then next week we're gonna do fifteen. Okay. All right. Uh, mm -hmm. we will we'll come back to it. I just I, I, I didn't want to continue last week because it was a good uh, seventy two verses in that chapter. <laughs> yeah, we would have been here a for a while. It's a long one. All right, so we'll go back to uh Verse number 41, Jesus is in the garden and he's asked them to pray with him. And they've been asleep. And as he comes back to them on verse 41 of Mark 14, he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Now they were under stress. Nothing like the stress he was under, but he keeps saying, You're going to betray me. He keeps saying, One of you is going to betray me. You're all going to betray me. Uh, he's given them some things, and it's heavy things to think about. And so these men doze off. And, you know, we talked about a little bit about Satan working on Jesus, but Satan can be working on these men as well. At, at one point, when uh, Jesus spoke to Peter, he said um, that Satan desired to sift him as one sifts wheat. Well, the way that we sift wheat, and we don't do it anymore, but the way they would sift wheat is they would lay the, 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 the harvested grass or wheat with the stalks and the, and the grain out on the threshing floor, and then they would beat it with a long stick, or they would have an oxen or a mule walk around on top of it to separate the grain from the, from the, uh, the, the rest of the, uh, the wheat stalk. And then they would take it and they would winnow it. They would throw it up in the air when the breeze was blowing and the seed would fall back down and the chaff would blow away. And I guess I'm not a farm boy, but I've heard that if you get that chaff down your neck, it's as bad as fresh straw or hay down your neck. It's pretty bad. And so Jesus said, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you, to, to really go through you and really... To really work on you. And if these guys are asleep instead of watching it, maybe that, that they're feeling the, uh, the, the pressure from Satan. Um, not that they were lazy. Not that they were unconcerned. But Satan can't possess us. But he can send thoughts to us. Uh, send things to us uh, uh, that would allow us to see depression or discouragement. And so a, a natural response to that to some people is for people to go to sleep. If I go to sleep, things will be better when I wake up. And, and so uh, if you ask me why they were sleeping, um, I don't know if they were tired. I think that they may have been facing a lot of pressure as well, and that's their response. So he, Jesus comes to them the third time, and he says to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. This is probably about midnight, midnight, one o'clock. All right. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the scribes, and the elders. So he said, I will lead you to the one that's called Jesus so you can arrest him in a quiet place, 
He knew that Jesus was going to the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives, um, and they sent a large group of men. Um, in the Passion of the Christ, it depicts them as like a ceremonial guard who are still guards. Um, you got to remember that Rome has their thumb on Israel, and so uh, they would be carefully watching what any armed body of men would be doing. So we, we, we just, we don't, we don't, they have swords, they have clubs, but this is under the cover of darkness, and maybe they're hoping the Romans won't see this. And um, they're coming with the authority of the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Verse 44, now his betrayer, Judas, had given him a signal saying, whoever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away safely. I don't think Judas quite understood exactly what was going to happen with Jesus. Because he acts surprised when he realized what's happening with Jesus. And um, he goes back and tries to take the money back and give it to them and have Jesus released. I don't know if he thought Jesus was going to be interrogated or imprisoned like John the Baptist. I don't know. And as soon as he had come, Immediately he went up to him and said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, and kissed him. So Jesus is walking towards this. Folks, Jesus prayed, let this cup pass from me, but not my will be done, but thy will, O Lord. And then at this place, he is walking. So it's not like Judas comes along with these guys and surprises Jesus. Jesus is walking towards them. And he comes up along and Judas comes up to him and says, Rabbi, Rabbi, it's a term of respect. Teacher, teacher, and kisses him, not on the lips, probably on the cheek. And um, in the other Gospels, it says that Jesus said, Friend, why have you come? And we read last week that Jesus said when uh, Judas was sent out to do his job, that Jesus said it would have been better for this man that he had not been born, speaking of Judas. But it's interesting, even in the midst of betrayal, Jesus offers forgiveness. Jesus offers an opportunity for repentance because that's what Jesus is all about. And so it says that he said, friend, why have you come? Now let's read on, verse number 46. Then they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Now in the other Gospels, uh, it, tell us, it tells us who had the sword. It also tells us, I believe, the name of the servant who had his ear cut off. Now it doesn't say it here, but we know that Jesus says, put away your swords to his followers who were not soldiers, who were not trained to fight against these guys. Um, if it's Peter, he takes a mighty swing at the guy's head and misses and cuts off his ear. So he's not a swordsman. He's a fisherman, and he's been following Jesus. Jesus reaches down, picks up the guy's ear off the ground, and puts it back on his head, and it's totally healed. I can imagine, <laughs> here this guy is, he's coming to arrest Jesus, and his ear's cut, cut off. And he's thinking he's going to be disfigured for life, and Jesus fixes that. So even in the midst of Jesus being arrested, he cared enough about this guy to fix his ear. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know anything about this man. Uh, history doesn't tell us, but who knows? I mean, there's speculation. Maybe he became a follower of Christ later. We don't know. Uh, but that happens. The ears cut off. Jesus puts it back on. Tells him to put the sword away. And then, verse 48, Jesus answered and said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. He said, Why do you have to come at night and do this? But it's prophesied that this would happen this way that Jesus would be taken at night under the cover of darkness. By the way, he's going to be taken into a courtroom 
and they're not allowed by law, by Jewish law, to hold court cases at night. It always has to be during the day. So this is all underhanded. Jesus said, you could have come and dealt with me, but remember, they didn't do it because they were afraid of the people, of the mob. So they have to do it in an underhanded way. Verse 50, then they, the disciples, all forsook him and fled. So they run away. They leave Jesus. Some ran a short distance. We'll read about Peter here in a minute. He just went a short distance, but the rest, they ran away. Remember, I said at the foot of the cross, we only know for certain that he, only one was there, and that's John. Now, verse 51 and verse 52 only occur in the Gospels in the book of Mark. And there's been a lot of speculation about exactly who this individual is that's being described in verses 51 and 52. Now, I was in Bible college. Nineteen seventy-nine. Nineteen seventy-nine. Nineteen seventy-nine. I graduated from high school. I went to Bible college in the fall of seventy-nine, and I graduated from Bible college in nineteen eighty-four. That's a long time ago, mm -hmm. 40 years ago. So um, I remember, though, in class, I, I don't think I'd ever come across this verse, but it seems like the professor said, by the way, um, you guys have heard about everybody that does all the streaking at the baseball games and the football games, and because that was a thing back in the 70s. Streaking is taking off your clothes and running across the field, okay? Um, not your shoes, though. You don't want to hurt your feet. And it was just a thing that they did to rebel, okay? Uh, and they said, the professor said, here in the Bible is an instance of somebody streaking. We're like, what? <laughs> what? And verse 51 and 52, and so we'll read that in just a moment. But they said, this is the kind of detail that I'm, of all the things that we see in the Gospels, Matthew approaches it one way, Mark approaches it another way, Luke is a doctor, and so he writes that way. A lot of John is not in any of the other Gospels. It's seen by John. This is a very intimate detail that they said, the professor said, was probably only known by the author of the book, who is John Mark. John Mark goes on the first missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas. He's related. Uh, Barnabas is his uncle or a cousin, and so he's related to him, and he goes on the first missionary journey, and uh, he has an issue because it's just too much for him, and he goes back home to Jerusalem, and later on, they go on the second missionary journey, Barnabas and Paul, and Barnabas goes, let's take John Mark again, and John uh, and Paul says to Barnabas, no way, no way, we're not doing it again. He messed up he didn't go with us now um that was a bit of pride on paul's part but actually god was working because god didn't need one team anymore to go on that missionary journey now you can have two because you have two trained missionaries and so they can take a man a piece and go and start new mission stuff and so barnabas and john mark went to the island of crete and uh, paul and silas went a different direction and later on, um, Paul writes in his epistles, and he says, bring John Mark with you, because he's profitable for my ministry. And we think that was about the time that John Mark was writing this, uh, the Gospels. And, and so uh, John Mark had some big things happen in his life. He was not one of the original disciples, but he is a follower, okay? And he has seen this stuff, and... It says in verse number 51, and this would be a detail that probably only John Mark would know if it happened to him, okay? Now, a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body. And the young men laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them, 
naked. Now, the speculation was that simply this, that the upper room may have belonged to Barnabas and John Mark's family. And so uh, John Mark, as a, as a disciple of Jesus, not one of the 12, but as a follower of Jesus, was paying attention uh, to what was going on in the upper room because it was Jesus and it was the disciple. It was Peter, James, and John. And so when they left, uh, maybe it, it, it woke him up or, or uh, and he followed them out to the Garden of Gethsemane, just wrapped up in his linen cloth because uh, he was hot, I guess. I don't know how they slept. I don't even want to get into how you sleep. Okay, I'm not going to tell you how I sleep, but uh, then, uh, or it could have been when the uh, the armed men who had swords and clubs, when they went through town, they made a little bit of noise, and John Mark woke up and started following along, and so he's there. Jesus has been grabbed by these guys, and the disciples all flee, and here's John Mark standing there, and one of them was, oh, here, look, here's a disciple, and so they go to grab him, and they all they get is his blanket his, his <laughs> linen cloth and he drops it and runs off okay so it's a very small detail and it's a very private detail that probably uh, and you say well why would john mark put that in there that's a very humbling detail for several reasons one he, just like the disciples, didn't do anything to stop the arrest of Jesus. And two, his exposure is a, is a terrible thing. It is night. It's midnight, one o'clock. Nobody's up except the, the men that have come to arrest Jesus and John Mark. But if you think about it, We all are like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden when they ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam and Eve both said, um, we're naked. And God's coming. So they made clothes out of fig leaves, which is not a real bright, a brilliant idea. <laughs> I would have found some elephant ears or something. <laughs> they made clothes out of fig leaves, and then they hid, like God wouldn't know where they were at. But when we stand before God, and we actually have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with God, we realize that the Holy Spirit will help us to know that everything is laid bare. All of our secrets... All the things that we think we're hiding so well from everybody in God's presence, it's as if we're naked before him. Everything's stripped away, and God knows us exactly. So this is a very humbling experience. And it's a humbling experience to know that God knows everything. You're not hiding anything from God. If you think you're doing it under the cover of darkness, <laughs> you're not hiding it from God. He can see in the dark. You think you're hiding it because you're doing it where nobody else is paying attention? You're not hiding it. God knows. God knows. He sees everything. So, uh, there are other possibilities who this could be. Uh, it's not anything that affects us doctrinally. If you don't, if you say, well, I don't think that's John Mark, it's somebody else, that's all right. That's just what I was taught when I was in Bible college. Verse 53. And they... The mob that arrested Jesus led away, led Jesus away to the high priest. And with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. Now they go to the high priest's house, who's called the Sanhedrin together, some of them. The ones that he knew would give a bad vote. And they're not supposed to have court at the house. They're supposed to have court at the temple. But they don't go to the temple. Peter followed him at a distance, so he ran away a short distance, and I think in the other Gospels it says that John is there as well, to sort of he knows somebody in, the San, he, in, the, in that council, and so they let him and Peter in to the courtyard. But Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of a high priest, and he sat with the servants and warmed himself 
at the fire. He He's sort of staying on the fringe. I want to see what's going on. And remember, Jesus has said, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Meaning, tonight. Now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. What has he said? What has he done? What have we heard? Who is, what has he been doing? For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. They're looking for something to have Jesus to be executed. The high priest has said it's important that someone die at this time to fix things. And they're thinking about Jesus. But they try to bring false witness and their testimonies don't agree. Then some rose up, verse number 57, and bore false witness against him, saying, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree. And Jesus has said, this temple is going to be destroyed, but if you destroy him, meaning himself, then he'll raise it up in three days. And they were always saying, well, what are you, what are you talking about? It took 70 years to fix this temple the way it is right now. And you're going to see it torn down and rebuilt in three days? Who do you think you are? And the high priest stood up in, uh, in the midst, verse 60, and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, that's prophecy, that he went dumb like a lamb to the slaughter. He did not make any utterance in his defense. He kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ? And remember, Christ means Messiah. Are you the Messiah? The Son of the Blessed. Jesus said, I am. Now that short little phrase is a powerful phrase. God's name in the Old Testament is I am. You might say, well, that's just a little short phrase, but it's a very powerful phrase. Mm -hmm. When Jesus was being arrested, they came and they said, are you so-and-so? And he says, I am. In the other Gospels, it says the men stepped back when he uttered that. Remember, this is the voice that spoke creation into existence. He speaks and there's stars in the heavens. He speaks and there's water and animals and plants and land. Man. Jesus says, I am. And you will see the Son of Man, me, sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. I am going to be on the right hand of God. Absolutely truthful but it blows their mind. The high priest tore his clothes and said, what further need do we have of witnesses? Now, you may have heard of somebody getting so upset they tore their hair out. That's not what happened to me. My hair is just given up. <laughs> I always thought I never want to be bald, but that's me. It's not because nobody pulled my hair out, not because I pulled my hair out. But they were so angry, and it was very much a, a thing to show their displeasure by grabbing and ripping at their clothes. Just to tear it up. Not like the Hulk did when he got mad, or his <laughs> shirt shreds, but he wears some amazing stretch pants every mm, time. Yeah. But they tore their clothes, and they said, this is it. What further need do we have of witnesses? We've all heard it. You've heard the blasphemy. He's saying he's God, that he's going to sit at the right hand of God. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Then some began to spit on him. I still don't like being spat on. That's cruel. Cruel. Years ago, I was a youth pastor, and some of the young people figured out 
But if they did their tongue a certain way, I forget, I think they called it gleeking or something. They could get a little bit of spittle. They weren't making sound like you're going to spit, but they could get a little bit of spittle to fly out and land on. So you'd be wet. And so I straight out told them, I said, if you spit on me by gleeking, I'm just going to go and spit on you. And so I remember that it wasn't real great illustration, I guess, or a great thing for me to do. I was still a young man. Uh, one of the kids gleeked and it got on me. So I just went. Because he goes, what'd you do that for? And I go, well, what do you think you've been doing to me? You're spitting on me. That's coming out of your mouth, isn't it? It's not like you cut water in your mouth and squirted at me or something. <laughs> Didn't use the squirt gun. So I, I just know that even in today's society, to spit on somebody is just to show absolute contempt. No honor at all. And these men are being used by God to condemn Jesus. It has to happen this way. Read Psalm 22. Read Isaiah 53. They began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him and to say to him, prophesy, who hit you, Jesus? Did you feel that? Who was it that hit you? And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands like they were slapping him. Now it's one thing for a man to beat on another man with a fist, but it's quite another. It's a whole different level of indignity to go up and to slap somebody. And they don't return the slap. Remember Jesus said, if someone hits you on the cheek, turn oh, yeah. the other cheek. This is nothing compared to what the Romans are going to do to them. No. <laughs> but they began the beating now. Now, I've, I've seen the movie The Passion of the Christ, and we know how terrible the guys treated Jesus, and they pushed him off the bridge in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, remember, the, the, the Passion of the Christ is a great depiction of the crucifixion of Christ, but it's not all based on Bible. It's based on some writings of man that, that say, well, we think this happened. It was a couple, it was a woman who wrote some of it, and um, Mel Gibson produced that movie, which is, I'll watch it, because it brings me to tears to see what Jesus went through for me. Well, that's the same way with me when, when I watch King of Kings. Amen. And Amen. I watched it a, a few times, and I, I just almost get tears in my eyes every time I watch it. Yes. To realize what Jesus went through for us. But um, to think of them doing these horrible things. This begins his beating. Verse 66. Now as Peter was below in the courtyard. Remember he's at the fire. What's going to happen to Jesus? One of the servant girls of the high priest came. When she saw Peter warming himself. She looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are saying. What? What are you talking about? <laughs> Me? Being with Jesus of Nazareth? <laughs> One. And he went out on the porch and a rooster crowed. Now, it's getting a little bit further along in the night, and if you have ever had roosters, they don't wait always for the sun to pop no, up. No, they just... If there's a glimmer the of light in the east, it could be your neighbor driving in the driveway, <laughs> the rooster starts crowing. Yeah. Four o'clock, three o'clock. So he leaves the fire and goes out on the porch, and the servant girl saw him again and began to say to those who stood by, this is one of them. This is one of the followers of Jesus. But he denied it again. And a little later, verse number 70, 
Those who stood by said to Peter again, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean, and your speech shows it. We've heard you talking. Your, ac your, your accent makes us think that you're not from here. When I go back to Georgia, I find myself talking like the people in Georgia do. My family got irritated at it one time. Because they're like, how come you're talking like this? Talk like you're from California, not from Georgia. I'm like, well, I adapt to where I'm at. But there was obviously a difference in uh, the Galilean language they could tell. It's just like you can tell if you're somewhere, if they're from California or from New England or from the Mid Midwest or from Texas. Everything is said a little differently and a little different inflection in the words and different words. Y'all and ain't and G and all that kind of stuff said in the south. So they know uh, who Peter is from. Who, or they know who he is and they know where he's from. And verse 71 is pretty sad. Then he began to curse and swear. I do not know this man of whom you speak. That had to really hurt Peter. Well, Peter really isn't thinking just yet. And, and Peter, I'm a lot like Peter sometimes, where I have a foot-shaped mouth, where I say things before I think it through, and I'm always having to pull my foot out of my mouth. Well, I think we all do. One time. Well, we hopefully as we get older, we sort of get a little bit of wisdom and think, oh, wait, I better not say that. Did I say that out loud? Um, but Peter has been told that he's going to betray Jesus, and yet he's not thinking. Because Peter is only thinking about Peter right now. He's not thinking about Jesus. Yeah, he's sort of there to see what's going on, but I think he's just concentrating on Peter. He gets to curse him. And says, I don't know who you're talking about. Verse 72. A second time the rooster crowed. Then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Now remember the account of John Mark of the gospel we think is uh, Peter speaking to him about what he had seen and done. So this is straight from Peter. Of course, the Lord has inspired this. Okay? But we, uh, we can really see what's going on in Peter's heart. It hit him like a ton of bricks. It hit him like a baseball bat upside the head. He could probably hear Jesus saying it in a still, calm voice. Before the rooster crows, remember he had said, I'll never betray you. I'll go to the death before I betray you. You will betray me tonight before the rooster crows twice. You'll deny me three times. Now, I believe it's in the book of Luke where this is being accounted. In Luke 22. Um, it says that as soon as he finished making that statement, they were moving Jesus from one part to another. And he saw, he, he locked gaze with Jesus right after the, as the rooster's crowing. We've read about the transfiguration of Jesus. He's a man, probably very nondescript. The Bible tells us that he's not very handsome, that we would think of him as being handsome. Probably uh, olive skin, Mediterranean coloring, brown eyes, black hair, brown hair. He, he doesn't look like the most handsome man in the world. Right? We know that Peter and John and James have seen Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration and have seen uh, his appearance that's his normal appearance okay when he put on earthly flesh and blood he put aside his shekinah glory it's called that's the glory of god his holiness um, 
that shines forth because of that. So um, Peter has seen that. In the book of Revelation, chapter 1, John gives us a description. He says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and um, I heard a voice speaking behind me as the rush of mighty waters. And, and I turned around, and I saw a figure in his eyes. He describes him, and he says, his eyes were a flame of fire. I think when Peter looked across and locked gaze with Jesus, that it was if Jesus' eyes looked deep within Peter's soul. I love my dad. My dad did a great job, my dad and mom, disciplining two rascally boys. I, I, I deserve every bit that I get from raising my three daughters with Darcy. All their rascally stuff because I did all that to my dad and mom. Um, and I, if I remember correctly, I think I got my last whooping when I was a freshman in high school. It was something I had done that my dad wasn't happy with. And, okay, we need to go have a little discussion in the bedroom. And he would say, okay, bend over the bed. And he'd take off his belt. Sometimes he would always say, you know, my dad would give me the buckle too, but he would never give my brother and I the buckle. He would just get the belt. We almost preferred dad's whippings over mom's because either she'd get the switch and go up and down our legs or she'd get the little <laughs> skinny vinyl belt out. Man, that thing hurt. Well, when I was 15, uh, me and my brother was tussling up in the bedroom, and I kicked the, I kicked the, I broke the window pane in the window. Uh oh. And Daddy heard it, and he uh -oh. came up there, and he said, "Which one of you boys did this?" And 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 my brother. Judge said, Quit me, Daddy. It was me. And he says, uh, Jerry Kelly, he says, uh, Is that the way it happened? Mm. And I said, No, Daddy, I, I kicked the window, I, I broke the window. Mm. So he said, Well, you're going to get a whipping. And so I bowed up at him and I said, you're not whipping me, old man. Hmm. And he hit me with his fist and knocked me back on the bed. Hmm. And I thought I was bleeding, but I wasn't. It was sweat. <laughs> my dad never raised his fist to me. It was always a belt. And I think that hurt my dad. Uh, Worse than anything that he'd ever done. Well, my dad always would say, this hurts me more than it hurts you. <laughs> and I always would say, you know, sort of to myself, well, you bend over the bed and let me spank you and see how you like it. <laughs> but when I became a father and, and, and I never tried to discipline the girls in anger. I always tried to discipline them with love. And it was always difficult. But... Um, after I was about 14, I got to the point where I, I could really quickly understand if my dad was unhappy with me. Um, I'd be sitting in church and we'd take the bulletins and we'd make paper airplanes or we'd be writing notes back and forth to each other. Hey, we're going to go here after, after church and eat. And Shame on you. We'd be talking and messing around. And I would dimly understand that my dad had stopped talking, stopped preaching. And I'd look up at him, and he would just look at me with disappointment. He wouldn't have to say a word. He would just look at me. And I knew that I had disappointed my dad tremendously. And so... I know exactly what was going through Peter's heart and his mind 
when the rooster crowed twice and he remembered and he looks across the courtyard and there stands Jesus, spittle dripping off of him, hands bound, bruised, swelling because they've already started to hit him. And he realizes that he betrayed Jesus. It says, and when he thought about it, he wept. Mm -hmm. There have been times that I felt like I betrayed Jesus. And I've wept. Because I've done things that I shouldn't do. Years ago at Knott's Berry Farm, they had a little chapel. It was over on the side where they put um, with Snoopy Land or Charlie Brown Land or whatever it is with all the little kitty rides. And it was over there. And you could go into it. And it was a beautiful little chapel. It was made out of like wall, out of wood. And they had a painting of Jesus. And the way that they would put the lights on it, and at first his eye, he'd be standing there, his eyes would be closed. And then they would change the lights, and his eyes would be open. Um, I think they've moved that chapel now off of the Knott's Berry Farm property, and another church, a church actually has it at their facility. I, I don't know if it's open to the public and if that painting is still in it. But I, I think of that sometimes when I think about what am I doing? The Holy Spirit convicts me and... and you know, we, we had little armbands a few years ago. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? And, you know, to, to think about what would Jesus do in this? Or what would Jesus think? Folks, Jesus is with us all the time. He indwells us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we might think we're hiding or we're getting away with something, but Jesus is right there. The Holy Spirit, God's right there. And so how often do we betray him? Well, I'll never betray you, Jesus. But then we do something or we say something or we think something and we've just... Petra, back in the 80s, had a song called Judas Kiss. I've been just like Judas. I've betrayed you. And think about what Jesus did for us in Romans... 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Why is it my reasonable service to give my whole self over to Jesus? Because he died for me. Mm -hmm. Be not conformed to this world, but by be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we ought to live differently because we're believers. Peter is broken. We don't even know that he was at the cross. Um, we don't know. We see him haltingly going to the empty tomb. And he, he's not fully fixed until he stands before Jesus on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus asks him, ask him three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And he gives Peter directions. And then we see in Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2 that Peter is a changed man. He's, been, he's repented. He's forgiven. He's not going to betray Jesus again. And his life is changed. I was just listening to Acts this in your morning. Bible reading. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And when they tell Peter not to talk about Jesus anymore. He goes, we ought to obey God rather than men. And they let him loose and say, don't mention Jesus' name. And he goes to the church and they have a giant prayer meeting and they say, Lord, help us to be more bold to talk about Jesus. If you've betrayed Jesus, if you've done things that you shouldn't do, you can ask his forgiveness. You can be repentant. Don't be sorry because you got caught. Be sorry because you know it's wrong. And change your life and live like he wants you to live. A holy life. Totally given over to him. And whatever he wants you to do. 
Next week we'll pick up in chapter 15. And we'll see the events leading up to his crucifixion and his crucifixion. <clears throat> we only have a couple more chapters here. Mark chapter 15 and Mark chapter 16. If you'd like to make some suggestions on where you'd like us to go after this, uh, I'll consider that and pray about it. Uh, I don't know how soon it will be before uh, we're allowed. Uh, we could probably start having Wednesday night Bible studies again. Uh, we just have small groups. Um, all, if you are interested in doing that, some of you are on uh, with me right now. If you're interested in restarting those, we'll take your temperature. We'll sit in a large, uh, larger room so that uh, you can keep your mask on and we'll return to our Wednesday night Bible studies. Um, but consider it and pray about it and let me know. I've enjoyed doing this verse by verse and I don't have a problem with continuing it. Um, and I may, if we go back to those Bible studies in person, I may do this but just do it on a different time uh, and talk about uh, verse by verse so that people will know what the Word of God has to say. I think it's important. But uh, thank you for spending time with us tonight and let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and we thank you for what you've done for us. I pray that you might help us not to betray you that we'll consider what you've done for us. And if we have betrayed you, Lord, thank you for 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I thank you for that. And be with us as we go about our week, the rest of this week. You be with Sam and with these other requests, some very serious things going on right now that you might answer those needs. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us tonight. God bless.